This is Right to Life Radio. And now, here's your host, John DeRoe. Well, good afternoon, good morning. Wait, what time? Sorry, the show airs in the morning. All right, I'm all, <laughs> right. I'm all confused. My clock is all screwed up. Good morning, America. If they're on the podcast, they might be listening Maybe. in the afternoon. That is true. If you're on the podcast, you might be in the you afternoon. Could, you could be like me for like... You know, last week, since I was not on the show, I, I caught up. I listened to the episode uh, driving, I think, late at night. There was, you go. Uh, All right. Was, well, welcome yeah. to Right to Life Radio, whatever, whatever, wherever you come upon this show. Right to Life Radio, a production, as always, of Right to Life Essential California, RTLCC.org. I am John Girardi, the executive director at Right to Life. I got Jonathan Keller from California Family Council here with me. We got Colton Metzler, producer Colton on the ones and twos. Uh, I heard this famous radio producer from Philadelphia who was called the Geeter with the Heater. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. I don't think it means anything vile, so I'll uh, ascribe uh, it to I'll, Colton, I'll I guess. So. All right. Okay. So what we are going to do for this first segment of Right to Life Radio, there's a lot of talk about the issue of IVF in the mm. news. Jonathan and I have been talking about this issue for the last, oh gosh, how many months now? Five months or so that this has At become least. part of the news cycle for infuriatingly stupid reasons. Well, initially it was a, a uh, furiating, not infuriating, it was furiatingly good. Um, I mean, it was kind of good, but then it the immediately Alabama, went bad. Yes. yes. Because yeah. because yeah. dumb conservatives cannot um, yeah. do anything but re- snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Right, so. yeah. So... Uh, the IVF issue became a big deal after the Alabama Supreme Court ruled on something that kind of sort of impacted IVF, basically saying, hey, if you negligently destroy IVF embryos, people can sue you over it. This somehow turned into an attack on the IVF industry, and then it turned into this huge news cycle in which Donald Trump and all these Republicans said that IVF is the most wonderful thing in the world and it has to be absolutely defended to the hilt, ignoring the serious pro-life concerns with IVF specifically the problem that there is so much wastage of human embryos involved in the IVF process as it's practiced in America today, along with other moral concerns. So uh, Jonathan and I have been discussing this at length. I've been infuriatingly, I've been, what were you saying? Infuriated (laughs) quite a lot. I think I got to, I've been quite angry at the way in which various national Republicans think that there's no constitutional role for limiting abortion through federal legislation, but there is apparently some constitutional role for promoting IVF You've via been federal. I've been incensed. There we Enraged. go. Uh, you're, you, did you just go to thesaurus.com I did. And, I did. and type in <laughs> infuriated? All right. Thank you, Jonathan. So I've been a- really frustrated at apparently promoting IVF, this practice that results in the deaths of thousands and thousands and thousands of embryos, is apparently a goal to pursue. But limiting abortion is not a goal to pursue at the federal level. So right. with that being John, said. Th- there's a key. There's a very key difference um, between these two. People like yes. IVF. One, one is yes. uh, electorally beneficial. The other is not. All right, so. exactly. All right, so producer Colton, let's pull up this clip. Now, producer Colton, as the man on the ones and twos, <laughs> the geeter with the heater, whatever that means. I'm have to um, now. Yeah, he was some famous radio DJ in Philadelphia or something. Anyway, um, producer Colton likes springing things on us by surprise. Yes. So Col- producer Colton has a surprise clip. This is from the DNC, the Democrat National Convention, which happened, uh, was that last week or was that two weeks ago? It was a week ago. A week I ago. It feels longer feels, than that. feels like longer than yes. that. All right. So here we go with our audio clip. This is my and Jonathan's live honest to God reactions to this audio clip from the DNC. Hit it. Taking away our freedom to control our bodies the freedom to become a mother through IVF like I did, those things are not going to improve the health outcomes of our wives, mothers, and daughters. Yes, so that was Michelle Obama. That was Michelle Obama. Wow. Okay, so first of all, I I did not know that she and Barack had kids via IVF. I I did not know that either. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it... I, I did not know that. <laughs> All right. Well, now let, let's talk about this, though, in a number of respects, because mm-hmm. she's very casually saying taking away our right to have children via IVF. So yeah. let me just lay out the facts of the matter. Literally no Republican 
anywhere in the United States of America has promoted in any way legally restricting IVF. I wish some of them had, but so, the fact of the matter is that they haven't. Certainly not at the federal level. Right. right. I would say this. Is it possible, given that there are, like, somewhere around 7,000 state elected representatives across the, uh, the country, is it possible that some backbencher in somewhere might have made a statement some saying— Some Idaho state legislator yeah, somewhere it's, said— It's possible. Maybe. But, but the, let yeah, me give you, to, to that point, John, the yeah. fact that Alabama's immediate response after their own Supreme Court issued this incredible pro-life ruling, well, it, Alabama's response I would, was... Eh, eh, I wouldn't even say it was necessarily pro-life. I mean, literally all it was, so for, for the context here. Going okay. back to February. Right, let's go back to February. So the context of, that Michelle Obama's talking about here is that the Alabama Supreme Court issued this ruling regarding a case, an individual case that happened in Alabama involving IVF embryos who were destroyed. So Alabama, like every state, has laws in place to civilly sue someone for a claim of wrongful death, all right? So if someone wrongfully caused my death, my wife might be able to sue that person for damages, okay? Alabama's wrongful death statute, it's, and, and so this is a civil lawsuit. It's not a criminal prosecution for homicide or something. This is a civil lawsuit trying to get money damages where you're not proving it beyond a reasonable doubt and throwing someone in jail. You prove it with a preponderance of the evidence to get a monetary, uh, a monetary award, okay? Monetary damages. In Alabama, their wrongful death statute had always been understood to include the death of human beings in utero. So embryos and fetuses. If, if you do something to a woman that causes injury to the woman and that results in the death of the embryo or fetus via a miscarriage, the couple can sue you for wrongful death. That counts as a wrongful death lawsuit. There was a case in Alabama where some guy wandered into a supposed to be secure area of an IVF clinic. He started handling a test tube that contained deep frozen embryos. Mm -hmm. It was really cold, it hurt his hand, he dropped it, and he destroyed a bunch of embryos. Which is horrific when you're realizing every single one of those embryos was a human organism created in the image and likeness of God with a unique soul and unique DNA that will never be seen in the history of the world, and it's actually a profound tragedy. Yep. Now, the Alabama State Supreme Court was called upon to ask, can the parents of those IVF embryos sue the IVF clinic via Alabama's wrongful death statute? And, and to put it, John, I want to be Careful here. I'm not, yeah. I'm not. I'm not making this. Um, this is not a gory yeah. uh, statement, but I'll just yeah. say, as an example, mm -hmm. if you had a a nursery mm -hmm. and a uh, careless individual uh, walked into the uh, the ICU unit, mm -hmm. and they or, or rather, or rather, a careless hospital allowed yes, someone so, yeah, this to is, walk this is, in. Yeah. yeah. So you had the hospital. Uh, here's the here's the uh, the uh, nursery, the ICU ward. The NICU and, ward, yeah. Yep, the NICU ward. And the uh, door was not locked. It was insufficiently secured. And some random hapless person walks in and trips like in a Looney Tunes cartoon. And they pull out the plug that unplugs a dozen ICU beds. NICU. Yeah, NICU and, beds. and a bunch of baby H stuff. Horrifically. If you had, if that would yeah. be national news. It right. would be, I think justifiably, everybody would be calling for yeah. the, the hospital the to hospital, be fine to keep yeah. them come. The hospital the, would be sued to death. Yes. I mean, that would be a, a the, massive... The, 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 uh, right. the CEO would probably never work again in the medical industry. Et cetera. Everybody would recognize this is a clear case of wrongful death, and the parents have a cause of action. They should be able to, they're never going to get their children back, but they right. should be able to sue for damages. Now, now imagine, though, characterizing that situation as, you're letting people sue the hospital? You must hate NICU units. <laughs> you must hate hospitals. Yes. So what Alabama decided was, well, we already allow people to sue for wrongful death when some action results in the death of an embryo or a fetus who's in utero. Right. 
why then wouldn't we allow a wrongful death suit for embryos who are out of utero, but in a test tube, in vitro? Right. So the Alabama Supreme Court says this. The IVF industry realizes, oh, gosh, that means that we could be subject to more litigation or, or more, you know, litigation with more disastrous financial consequences for us. I don't see how that ruling is in any way, shape, or form anti-IVF. Yeah, it means IVF clinics have to be careful and exercise caution and not, it's not even saying that IVF clinics uh, can't waste embryos if the parents want that, which which I think is horrific, but, but right. basically there's no risk to them if they do that. It's just saying, hey, if the parents don't want their embryos destroyed, you gotta be careful and make sure no one destroys them. Right. That somehow got turned into, one, having anything to do with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right. which it absolutely 100% didn't. It was the Alabama Supreme Court interpreting Alabama law. And it then got spun up into all Republicans want to ban IVF, which instead of, Donald Trump and national national Republicans like Ted Cruz saying this is a silly news story. This has nothing to do with overturning Roe v. Wade. This is ridiculous. Instead, what happened? Every Republican elected official in Alabama falls onto their fainting couch. They pass some new law giving total uh, enormous levels of insulation from litigation to the IVF industry in Alabama to a ridiculous, absurd degree. And then you've got Ted Cruz and Katie Britt, the U.S. Senator from Alabama, running around introducing Mm. legislation to promote IVF in all 50 states using federal programs to help promote IVF. You've got Donald Trump saying, yes, I want to promote IVF in all 50 states. You've got it thrown into the Republican platform, the same Republican platform that couldn't find the space somehow to say, we think that all human life is valuable from conception to natural death. We think there should be a human life amendment to the Constitution. We, th- we oppose abortion. We think states should move to limit abortion. No, didn't have time for that, but we did have time to say how wonderful IVF is. So this is Michelle Obama lying, knowingly saying things that are wrong because there is not a single Republican in this country, to my chagrin, frankly, who is calling for the limitation of IVF. This is a de- the Democrat Party is so obsessed with this. They are they are not doing it, 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 the whole IVF story is so frustrating. It is such a complete embrace by the Republican Party of this completely illogical position when it comes to apparently the lives of unborn children if they are inside of a womb are valuable, but if they are in Glass in vitro, you know, a way of producing children that rich people can afford, yep. but not poor people who get abortions. Then the poor people who get abortions, oh, they're they're bad. But the rich people who get IVF and destroy, you know, seven embryos for every one embryo who comes to term, whatever the whatever the ratio is, no, they're fine, they're good. Um, it's it's so frustrating. And and again, I want to say this just with. I recognize that people who turn to IVF, so many of them are good people, well-meaning people. They're they're not even, in many cases, I don't know that they're even understanding the wastage rate of embryos. They're not doing it out of desire to do that. And they're, they're facing difficult challenges with their fertility. I recognize that. And I don't mean to be dismissive of them, but it doesn't change the reality of how IVF is practiced in the United States today, which just involves the destruction of so many embryos for any one embryo that actually winds up surviving. Uh, literally, I think, John, I saw one one uh, number on Twitter the other day that said something along the lines of, for every child born of IVF, there are, they have between, you know, six to 20 siblings right. who are either dead well, or on ice. Yeah, well, we and we had the story about, you know, Paris Hilton, who allegedly, so Paris Hilton, the famous... She doesn't really have a job. What is her job? <laughs> reality, hotel reality, t- the hotel heiress, yes. reality TV show person, yes. socialite. We say socialite for lack of any actual job. 
uh, she has talked about how she and her husband were trying to do IVF and that she just wanted was she just wanted a, a boy or just wanted, just a, girl. wanted a girl? I think. And she kept yeah. conceiving boys, and then so they she did, kept think, getting rid of like rounds of IVF. yeah, and so they got rid of all of these boy embryos so that they could get a girl, which, which is just horrific. And, and so, apparently anyway, they they still yeah. have those ones on ice there, but yeah, but then but then it's this this horrible ethical dilemma that you've got all of these human beings sitting in stasis in a deep freeze with no real prospect of anyone going to, you know, embryo adopt them. So it, it, it's a, uh, it, it's just a horrific thing. And I've been just so demoralized about sort of the drift of the Republican Party huh. and, and so many pro-lifers, frankly, on this issue. All right. We'll talk a little bit about the state of play with the election and actually in the next segment, Jonathan, we're going to talk about a horrible California bill on IVF that has been resurrected. That is next on Right to Life Radio. We're back with Right to Life Radio. After, <laughs> If you only the, knew. If you only knew what goes on in the breaks where producer Jonathan just wildly <laughs> wasted all of our time <laughs> looking for some video clip that specifically just, did not say the I, thing he well, thought well, it said. It's, I, we all know what it said. We all know. <laughs> Jeez Louise. You the, know. The, let's and just I know. say, folks, that, that if there was a Right to Life Radio after dark, it would be some wild, <laughs> like, they would play it. It, it might be competing with Coast to Coast, well, that's right. which you can listen to, uh, I think, pretty much Monday through Friday. I forget the exact times, but yeah. right here on Power Talk, you can listen to Coast to Coast. All right. So, uh, Jonathan, let's continue our discussion about IVF. It is continuing to be a big topic of conversation. It's continuing to drive electoral uh, the, drive the election with the Harris Walls campaign saying Republicans want to ban it. I wish more Republicans wanted to do stuff to limit IVF due to the large number of wastage of embryos that is involved in it and, and various ways in which I think the practice of IVF has some really troubling elements that really do need to be more tightly regulated, but that is not the case. Republicans are, if anything, being enormous sycophants towards the IVF industry. Uh, and this leads us to a resurrected piece of California legislation that we haven't uh, talked yes. about for a year that is out of the suspense file mm -hmm. from one of the California legislature appropriations committees. So take it away, Jonathan. That is correct. So uh, every year, let me just give a little bit of a background. Every year, the California legislature has a two-year session. Okay. You start in, actually, technically this year, since it's an election year, all the legislators will uh, stand for election on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Uh -huh. And unlike some states where you've got this long kind of lame duck period, we actually, John, swear in our state legislators pretty quickly. Uh, they are right, sworn well, in like right after Thanksgiving. Okay. They so start we, quickly. We have, we have two-year legislative sessions. Right. What is this bill? This bill. So this bill, which had been introduced last year, it was put into the suspense file Correct. of the, was it the Assembly or the Senate appropriations? Uh, the Senate. Okay. Uh, uh, no, wait. Sorry, sorry. The, it, the bill assembly. is from the Senate, but it is in, in the, the okay. Assembly appropriations. Okay, so basically what happens in the California legislature, yep. you have to go through, a you introduce a bill. It has to go through a bunch of committees, but if the bill spends money, right. it has to go through what's called the appropriations committee. It has to go through the Assembly appropriations committee and the Senate appropriations committee. And basically the Democrats who run this thing, decide, do we really want to pass this or don't we? And if they decide they don't want to pass something, they basically let it die in the Appropriations Committee by putting it in what they call the suspense file. So It's like it, that scene in Gladiator where Commodus, Emperor Commodus, has the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Yeah, and they just kind of thumbs sideways it, yep. I guess. Yep. And, and in fact, much like IVF, mm -hmm. this is where a bill will remain in frozen <laughs> stasis uh, indefinitely. Now, a bill that last year was put into one of the suspense files of one of the appropriations committees has now all of a sudden come out of the suspense file and Democrats are trying to pass it. And this is to promote California state insurance funded IVF. So take it away, Jonathan. What does this bill do? All right. So this bill, John, it's, it, it's almost hard to believe it redefines infertility itself. Okay. Uh, this is the key issue here. It would be one thing if it said, hey, we're going to offer coverage for IVF, and we want to make sure that any couple who uh, is having trouble having children, they can have coverage for IVF. In some cases, John, it is already true that certain 
health insurance plans do provide some sort of infertility care or coverage. Okay. Usually it has a pretty low cap. I can tell you, for example, when Julia mm-hmm. and I were uh, struggling with infertility way back mm-hmm. when, she worked for Clovis Unified School District, and they had um, a, a very low cap on fertility services that you could have. Mm-hmm. Now, that wasn't an issue for us because we did not want to do IVF. Right. But even just for, you know, diagnostic treatments right. and... Uh, you know, going and getting your your levels of hormones and everything else mm-hmm. checked, getting um, seeing if all of so the things were working. It, it's just not something that insurance plans are covering very no. extensively, and, and, yeah. and because it can be incredibly expensive. I mean, right. a, a single round of IVF can cost you know. Uh, the, the lowest I've heard used to be maybe ten to twenty thousand. Now I hear it's more like thirty to fifty thousand. So how is this bill mandating IVF coverage? So is it mandating that private insurances yes. have this as part of their coverage? Yes. Is it mandating that it be part of Medi-Cal coverage? So not Medi-Cal coverage yet, but what it does require is that uh, it demands. I'll read it here. It says basically you have to have up to three possible implantations. Uh, you can be around by the insurance. Insurance. Yes. And um, essentially, setting aside for a second the fiscal concerns, if you go to mm-hmm. our website, californiafamily.org, you can look at the financial impact. Um, essentially, a single cycle here, according to what we saw, is between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars, but then when you factor in all of the other tests that a lot of times people do, including the medications and genetic testing and mm-hmm. the freezing, it's twenty to thirty thousand dollars per cycle. Yeah. So putting that together and saying that you would potentially have up to three implantations, you're you're talking about tens of thousands, possibly even close to a hundred thousand dollars in new mandated costs. Mm-hmm. That's bad enough, John. Yeah. That, that, but that's now, bad who enough. is eligible for this? Well, this is the crazy thing because. Again, just talking about in my the personal next, In the next two minutes here. My personal experience, when Julia and I were facing infertility, it was a it was something where they said, look, until you have been trying to get pregnant for at least a year or more and we're you can't get pregnant, yeah. th- you know, you're not considered infertile. Well, they have kept that timeline. <laughs> yes. But they have now said that um, if you are the new the new thing says, I'll read the line here. Uh Infertility, for purposes of this section, infertility means they stroke out a disease. They said means a condition or status characterized by blah, 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 the 12-month period. But then number two, a person's inability to reproduce either as an individual or with their partner without medical intervention. So, John, I... So, basically what this means is we are going to have mandated coverage for IVF for same-sex married couples... Uh, or single people. Yes. So, it, which, like, yeah, I, I, as a single person, I'm not. I've not yet found a way to asexually reproduce to, to separate <gasps> uh, separate right. my cells to form two John Girardis uh, as opposed to one. There literally has been even even counting or the immaculate conception mm-hmm. uh, that was. Um, external means. It was not a medical intervention. It was divine intervention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, Jesus wasn't the... Mary was the immaculate conception. Oh, anyway, right, right, right. Anyway, sorry, anyway sorry. yeah. But yeah, short of, uh, short of the conception of the My, child Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary... Correct. Really hard for a single person to reproduce in any sense. Okay, yes. so that is what is potentially coming to California. State-mandated coverage for IVF, which is going to jack up insurance premiums, increase the cost of plans, et cetera, et cetera, just going to continue all the problems that we have with health insurance stuff in California. And create a whole new generation of motherless slash fatherless children. That is true. And and also with uh, IVF uh, creation of embryos for same-sex couples off the bat depriving children of either a biological male father or a biological female mother. When we return... We will talk about uh, sort of the national conversation with comments by uh, former President Trump and Mr. Pen- and Mr. Vance regarding abortion. Next on Right to Life Radio. Oy vey. With that, with Jonathan's uh, <laughs> oy vey, Right to Life Radio is back from our commercial break. All right, everyone. Oy vey was, in fact, the <laughs> reaction I had uh, when Jonathan texted me the the comments from both Donald Trump and J.D. Vance over the last uh, sort of week. J.D. Vance last weekend was on the Sunday talk shows defending this idea. Trump has been tweeting or truth socialing out some stuff about this. And it is with regards to uh, basically the the 
just reaffirming the position that the Trump advance ticket is not going to push for any kind of federal restrictions on abortion. And then Trump tweeting out that his administration would be, quote, great for women and their reproductive rights. What All right. does that mean, John? Reproductive that, rights? Reproductive that, rights, huh? I've heard that phrase before Yeah, I've, I've literally only heard that phrase from pro-choice people. All right, so I want to talk about this. Um, and, and I'm I'm frustrated and getting more and more frustrated and just getting more and more tired of, I'm tired, boss, <laughs> in the words of Michael Clark Duncan, I'm tired, boss. Uh, this election is just getting me more and more depressed. Now, I, I just want to clarify for people. First of all, I live in California. 99% of this show's listenership is in California. So if you're going to say, you're going to stop people from voting for Donald Trump, Gerardi, you're, you're the reason that people are, that he's going to lose the election if you keep saying, it's making you. people depressed and suppressing voter... That's you, John. I am not... I am not this radio show is not changing the outcome of the election. And also it's a 501c3 show, so we don't endorse or oppose any elected officials. Uh, we comment on the positions of people who are running. That's what we do. Okay, and we, we comment on public policy and we talk about what's happening locally and statewide and nationally when it comes to the abortion issue. So that that's all I'm doing here. All right. I have been, though, more and more concerned about the shift of the Republican Party when it comes to the abortion issue this election cycle. And and I feel like so much of it is in response to one bad election, mm -hmm. the 2022 election. One bad election has resulted in the Republican Party basically collectively, and it's not, frankly, I don't even think it's a, the Trump crowd is just doing it. I feel like there are more establishment e Republicans who are gleefully joining, just wanting to run away from the life issue completely and abandon ship. And it's really disturbing um, I, to hear J.D. Vance say that, you know, no, 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 no. Well, we, that President Trump would, in fact, veto a bill to limit abortion on a nationwide level if it came to his desk. Um, not say there's no way that there's going to be a federal bill to limit abortion that gets on President Trump's desk. I mean, it's just impossible with the makeup of the Senate. Even if Republicans had 60 votes, it's unlikely that that could happen. They could even get the, enough votes. We don't support breaking the filibuster in the, rule in the Senate, so therefore th this is just not an issue. No. Vance is affirmatively saying that Donald Trump would not support legislation to limit abortion. And I, I can hear the response from people who are getting mad at me. I can hear the response of, look, President Trump thinks that abortion should be dealt with on the state level, that it shouldn't be a federal issue. And I can also hear the dumber people saying, <laughs> Roe v. Wade left the issue to the states. Stop. Okay. John, Roe we've v been fighting for this the whole time. What are you complaining about? Exactly. Uh, first of all, I was not fighting for abortion to be left to the states per se. I was fighting for abortion to be illegal. I was fighting for babies to stop dying. That is my goal. That is what I want. That is what I am concerned with. Okay, so first and foremost, let's not confuse the means with the end. We needed Roe v. Wade to be overturned as a means to outlawing abortion. Secondly, the Dobbs decision, the overturning of Roe v. Wade does not purely turn abortion over to the states. It turns abortion over to the normal lawmaking processes of this country, whether that is through state legislation or in appropriate, relevant ways, Congress. Congress can pass laws to restrict abortion in various kinds of ways as long as there is some kind of federal hook. It is a very open question whether it is an open question, I would say, and, and frankly, it's it's only an open question because there's some libertarians who live in this la-la land where they think that uh, the last 90 years of Supreme Court decisions interpreting a lot of different kinds of things, interstate commerce haven't happened. But certainly, I think it's more than debatable that Congress would, in fact, be able to pass a law to limit abortion on a nationwide scale and have it hold up in the courts. 
the idea that I hate, that I, I am so angry at, that I, I refuse to be lectured about is people who try to s tell me, one, either, well, no, no, uh, uh, overturning Roe v. Wade just turns it over to the states. No, it did not just turn it over to the states. There it is a ton says. of, and also there is a ton of abortion policy that is inextricably federal. Yes. Let, let me just repeat that. Oh, a ton gosh. of abortion policy is inextricably federal. It is not even dealt with at the state issue. Do you want Title 10 to fund abortion? It's a federal program. Depending on what the president does or does not do, it's going to fund abortion or not fund abortion. A president needs to decide. Will we have foreign aid promoting abortion overseas? Will well, we allow the military to do abortions? Well, well, John, let me give you a very basic. How will the FDA regulate the abortion pill? These you, are all federal. Well, well, and I was also going to say, okay, you, you don't want uh, any federal role in abortion. Great. So you oppose a uh, you oppose any use of um, I don't know, federal agencies like the United States Postal Service uh -huh. <laughs> to be shipping abortion drugs and devices between different states. You're going to leave yeah. it up to the states. And if states want to have abortion, they can develop their own abortion pills in state. They can make manufacture they can their own have abortion private, stuff. They can have private yeah. uh, shipment, have yeah, FedEx have couriers, or, have but, FedEx or uh, yeah, you, you, but you can't, you know, UPS you can't ship do it. things between states because it's now just a sole state yeah. issue. There's Wh no which, federal role. Which, by the way, there is a federal law on the books called the Comstock Act, yep. never repealed, Yep. That says you can't ship immoral materials, which is vague and undefined, but one of the the things that they define as immoral materials, which is not vague, is abortifacients. Mm -hmm. You can't ship abortifacients through the mail. It, is the president going to enforce that? Uh, these are all federal questions. It's not a state question in all these respects. Now, if you're just talking about gestational age limitations on abortions, okay, that's fine. You can, and, and also there's this. If you want to try to argue with me on a kind of strict interpretation of the Constitution grounds, the federal government does not have a role in regulating abortion. This goes beyond the intent of what the framers of the Constitution envisioned. Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce, which is one of the powers that Congress has in Article One, that doesn't mean that they can either legally allow or limit or you know, pay, place a gestational age limit. That doesn't mean you, you can place a gestational age limit on abortion. The federal government doesn't shouldn't have a role in regulating abortion in that way. All right, if you want to make that argument to me, if you're if you want to make that argument to me, okay, that's fine. But don't you dare make that argument to me if you like Ted Cruz have voted a hundred gazillion times for federal legislation to limit abortion before Roe v. Wade was overturned, right. when you just knew it wouldn't actually come into effect. Don't make that argument to me if, like Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz is really on the receiving end of a lot of criticism on this show. Uh, if, if, like Ted Cruz, if you, if you are going to be like Ted Cruz or Donald Trump and say, there's no federal role for regulating abortion, that's not what the framers of the Constitution envisioned. That, that's, the Constitution doesn't allow us to regulate abortion. The founders obviously cared about regulating and promoting IVF. That's what they well, cared about, Well, John. yeah, that's the thing. So on the one, on the one side of your mouth, you're this strict, oh, strict libertarian, like, oh, that this is only, the only things that the Constitution allows Congress to regulate is this and this. You can't, you can't prohibit abortion. But you can promote IVF. Pick one. All right, pick one. And if your logic is basically the one is popular and the other is not, then sh shut up. <laughs> Get out of my face. Go take a long walk off a short pier. I, I am sick of these arguments. And it, it, it just, it really frustrates me. It, uh, on a personal and individual level, I am so depressed about this election and and I feel like there's just so few things that would have to be done to at least get pro-life voters to feel a little bit better because here's another thing I've seen a lot of response from pro-life figures I saw a poorly written piece from lifenews.org um, <laughs> arguing this that uh, you know President Trump in his first term Here's all these things that he did, blah, 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 blah. Most pro-life president most, ever. You know, most pro-life president ever. This election cycle, and, and, and by the way, I agree. President Trump did a lot of great things in his first term. He cut off all the federal funding for abortion in all the various ways that he had direct control over. 
He did stuff that prior presidents hadn't done, cut off federal funding through Title X, in, which, which George W. Bush didn't even do, um, appointed very good judges. Trump hasn't said anything about the caliber of – or the kind of judges, the quality of judges, the caliber of judges. No list have we been given of prospective Supreme Court picks. Don't need it this time. Just haven't, haven't received it. Uh, no I, commitment has been made about the Mexico City policy and whether he's going to reinstate it to cut off federal funding to overseas NGOs that perform abortions. No word has been said about whether he's going to pursue cutting off Title X funding for abortion providers. No word about military abortions. Nothing. So, John, if I can, I want to I make a, a bigger picture observation here quickly. For this election... It feels like less less people complain to us, and they start mm -hmm. writing in and yelling. Why are you attacking President Trump? Why? Are, yeah, why yeah, yeah. Don't you know that this and is going to lead to a Harris I will, administration? I will also affirm Kamala Harris is an absolute disaster and a train wreck, and will be absolutely worse on the abortion issue in every the, single way possible. The, I admit that. The, the, here's the big picture thing that I'm looking at. It feels like I was joking with some friends of mine earlier. John, I don't know if you saw this right before we started recording. We got news that uh, Kamala Harris announced after being a candidate for over a month, mm -hmm. that she's going to have her first sit-down interview mm -hmm. uh, with Dana Bash at okay. CNN okay. as a joint interview with Tim Walz. Okay. She still is not doing an actual one-on-one -on -one sit-down interview. Yeah. She's also not releasing any policies. You go to her website. Yeah. She has no policies on her website. The reason I bring that yeah. up is it feels like both these candidates right now, Trump, President Trump is looking at Kamala Harris and going, well, she doesn't have to actively say what she's going to do. She's not releasing a yeah, list. So why should I? He's. It feels like both candidates at this point are pr playing prevent defense. Right. And they. Last time, President Trump realized, look, I know I'm an unknown quantity. I've never been elected before. I got to give something to the pro life community to let them know. Look, I'm gonna. I'm I'll, gonna. I'm gonna fight for you. I'm yeah. gonna be on your side. So here's my list of Supreme Court nominees. Here's what I'm gonna do. And he released a list both in 2016 and then he released an updated list in 2020. Yeah. yeah. But like you said, this year nothing. Nothing. All right. When we return, we'll have our closing thoughts. Again, Kamala Harris supports much worse policies than anything President Trump's done. But I need more than blind faith assurances. That's next on Right to Life Radio. Back with Right to Life Radio, we just wanna promote for all of you listening, this is of course a production of Right to Life of Central California. We at Right to Life have a bunch of stuff coming up this fall. We're gonna be at the Fresno Women's Conference uh, later on in September. We're gonna be at the Madera District Fair, September 4th, 5th, uh, no, it's September 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. Okay. So if you're at the Madeira Fair, come see our booth. We'll also be at the big Fresno Fair. We're looking for volunteers who might be interested. You can get in touch with us at righttolifeca.org or give us a call at 559-229-2229 if you want to volunteer with us. Jonathan, you've got an event coming up too. I do. Our 2024 Life Family Liberty Gala. It'll be in Orange County. The Orange County Costa Mesa Hilton. It cool. is September 28th, Saturday, September 28th. We have Kaylee McEnany, hey, former, former Trump uh, press, press secretary. secretary and current Fox News host. She's a great speaker, really uh, nice gal. Uh, we would love to have you join us. Yes, it's a bit of a drive, but uh, mm -hmm. beautiful Orange County. Come down and join us. You can find out more at cfcgala.com. Very good. And uh, also, folks, don't forget, Thursday, September 5th is the two Larry Kings right to life event they've got jim caviezel yes they got jesus himself uh, he will be speaking you can go to tkrl.org to learn more about that event and uh again you know this was kind of a bummer of a show jonathan we were, we were a bit down in the dumps yes. but you know keep the faith everyone keep working we at right to life we're just trying to save every single soul we can every single person who comes our way that's what we try to do. Amen. And by the way, I, I do acknowledge, yeah, Kamala Harris's policies that she's openly supported are much worse than Donald Trump's. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think I can still speak truth to power and say when I think things are bad, even mm -hmm. if a person with an R next to their name says it and in, we're a 501c3, we can criticize whom we want to criticize. That'll do it. Right to Life Radio. See you next time on Power Talk.